podcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright. Here's the broadcasting from deep within the heartland of the the third. Wow. Today has been crazy. Okay, so... <laughs> I was trying to get the show up and running here, and for some reason it kept looping our intro. Uh, so I apologize about the delay. We are six minutes behind schedule right now, and for that, I apologize. Uh, as usual, I always screw something up in terms of technology, so I must have done something wrong. I'm positive it was my fault. So anyway, uh, without further ado, my name is Mac Worley III. I am the host of this show, and uh, this show is called On the Move. It's the show that attempts to inspire you to stand up for your rights. Today is May 24th, 2015, and today's show is titled Dismantling the Surveillance State. Is this actually happening, or are we playing some sort of political games here? We're going to get into that. Uh, we got to pick up on the topic that we were, said we were going to talk about last week, but we never did, which was uh, the American Revolution 2.0. Is that a good thing for liberty? Would that work out well for us libertarians, conservatives, uh, people who value independent individual liberty? Would that be something good for us or not? Also, this is episode 72 of the program. If you are listening to us for the first time, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in. Secondly, I would just like to give you guys a heads up that we broadcast every Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We discuss all things liberty, guns, government. Things along those lines, we deviate, uh, you know, a whole bunch of different topics. But basically, if it affects the topic of liberty, we are going to talk about it at one point or another. So, our featured topics for today, uh, as I said, we're going to talk about the revolution thing. That's going to be the first topic that I want to bring up. Would that be good for us, good for liberty in America? Uh, And I want to talk about, like I said, Rand's. Uh, Rand Paul's uh, recent move to dismantle the Patriot Act, or at least portions of it. So we're going to deep dive into that, and uh, I'll give you my analysis. Additionally, I also want to bring up a bunch of random stories, but one in particular that I want to bring up um, is pretty infuriating on on my behalf here. I, you know, I, I personally was astounded by what one American city is doing right now, and they've been doing it for a while, uh, and they are going ticket crazy. Ticket, ticket, ticket. They are producing revenue for that city under the guise of public safety, uh, but really what they're doing is nanny-stating you on your own private property. We're not talking about moving violations, by the way, as in traffic violations with your car. We're talking about uh, they give you citations on your front door for crazy infractions. We're going to talk about them coming up here. So as usual, if you all would like to join in the conversation, you could do so in a lot of different ways. Let's go ahead and list them off right now. First, you can call us 360-450-5625. Again, that number is 360-450-5625. Or you can email us at talk at onthemoveshow.com. So those are two great ways that you can get involved. Additionally, we have uh, Facebook, so you can message us on facebook.com forward slash on the move show. Uh, even if it's not during the live broadcast, I'll read your message off if it's pertained to the conversation. If I thought you had a particularly good point, we'll read it on the air. Uh, also, you can get us on Twitter at on the move show. That's another great way to get a hold of us. So uh, anything you'd like to discuss today is on the table. We're kind of freestyling. We have a few things that we need to get to as far as these articles and everything and uh, our main topics. But any uh, anything that you guys want to bring up, feel free. Uh, you know, the, the mic is open. So, you know, let your voice be heard. Essentially, our backpack phone lines are open. So feel free to light them up. Uh, also. Let's get into some housekeeping things right now because I, I want to see something uh, from you guys. And if, if you don't mind, I would really appreciate it. If you would go to Spreaker.com, that's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. It's like the word speaker except with an R in there, Spreaker.com. You go to there, Spreaker.com forward slash on the move show. If you go to our page there, there is a button that says follow. If you don't have a Spreaker account, I would really appreciate it if you would please go there, Spreaker.com forward slash on the move show, sign up. And basically all it's going to do is give you notifications. And it also, it looks good for our show. You are helping by doing this, you are helping support our program. By by following our program, it shows, hey, we have active listeners who are out there who give a crap about our program. And, and 
also it'll let us know that you guys want to hear more of it because you're following our stuff so if you do that I would really really appreciate it again that's Spreaker.com forward slash on the move show all right so let's go ahead and move forward here I'm gonna list you off here uh, our website uh, on the move show.com again Spreaker.com forward slash on the move show Facebook.com forward slash on the move show YouTube.com forward slash on the move show and Twitter.com forward slash on the move show all right so let's all the housekeeping stuff's done. Let's get to the, the meat of the program here. But before we do, uh, I, have to, I have to just mention it. It's, it's about to be Memorial Day. And I know many Americans out there think that Memorial Day is all about barbecues and, you know, getting a day off of work and just kicking it back and relaxing. However, you know, I, I personally take this day and this holiday extremely seriously. So uh, I, I want to... to First of all, I, I have an article here from, from redmillennial.com, um, and I want to read this because this, this, I think, is particularly important, especially on this day. Uh, Memorial Day is the day that we remember all the people that have died while serving in the military. This holiday not only marks the beginning of summer vacation, but it's when we are supposed to come together and remember those who paid the ultimate price for freedom. This tradition started after the American Civil War in 1868, but it was called Decoration Day. And by the 20th century, Memorial Day took over uh, to honor all American military soldiers. Let me introduce to you 10 Air Force Security Forces members that died while protecting our freedom during the war. Now, I don't know if any of you are are aware, but I, I personally was in the Air Force. I served, I was security forces. So, you know, this is particularly you know, close to home for me because these are, you know, my brothers and sisters who I served with, you know, I, I, I personally don't know anyone on this list, thank goodness, but, you know, it's, it's still very sad. And, you know, any one of these people could have been me. It could have been any of the friends that I, I, I knew. So, you know, thank goodness for that. But we still, we lost some, some great Americans. So anyway, our first we have here is uh, Airman First Class Elizabeth Nicole Jacobson, we lost Technical Sergeant Jason Lynn Norton. We lost Staff Sergeant Brian Scott McElroy. We lost Airman First Class Lee Bernard Emmanuel Chavez. We lost Staff Sergeant John T. Self. Airman First Class Jason D. Nathan. Staff Sergeant Travis L. Griffin. First Lieutenant Joseph D. Helton. Senior Airman Nicholas Jerome Alden. Staff Sergeant Todd T.J. Labreco. And, uh, okay, so I think it's, it's really important that we remember all of these people and the sacrifices that they made. You know, they may have joined for you know, a variety of different reasons. You know, they, they, they may have been patriotic and wanted to, to fight for their country. They may have, you know, just wanted college money, whatever it was. And this is, this sounds so cliche because we hear it all the time, but this is so true. You know, these people, they signed a blank check when they signed up. Whatever their reasons for it was, you know, they had no idea what was going to happen with their life. Absolutely no idea. And I can speak firsthand for the sacrifices that you make when you are in the military. Uh, you know, I personally, and I want to make it known, I did not deploy, but... You know, even the fact that I, I was in the military, you lose freedoms. You you lose the ability to, to basically govern yourself. You are not the owner of yourself. It, the government at this point owns you. And you actually lose a lot of the rights that you're, you're you know, fighting for, that you swore an oath to, to protect. You lose it just by signing up. So... You know, it's, it's important to note that, you know, for me, my base, I didn't deploy. So, you know, I, I don't look at my time in the military as, you know, I, I've, I did something great for, for my country. You know, I, I went in with the intention of serving and, you know, I did, I did what the government wanted me to do, but, uh, you know, I, I kept trying to get deployments, you know, especially my first few years and my base, the base that I was at, we had, uh, we had nuclear weapons on it, well, not well, actually, yeah, we did have nuclear weapons on the base, but um, it, basically my job was to secure nuclear weapons out in the missile field. And most bases, their job is to basically train to deploy. So, you know, for me, I have a lot of respect for people who have deployed. I, I don't, I'm not trying to downgrade my service, but, you know, I, I, I didn't deploy and I can't even imagine the, the kind of, you know, 
stuff that people have to go through when they're doing that. I mean, I, I, I have friends who've deployed and we've talked about it and, and all that, but you know, I personally can never imagine what it was like for them. You know, I can only hear their stories and you know, that's from the people who I'm lucky enough to hear their stories from, you know, these, these 10 airmen, we're not able to hear their stories. So it's important that we remember them. Anyway, we're going to go ahead and move on guys. Move, uh, move to something else, uh, and actually, let's go ahead and get into the uh, the, the American Revolution um, conversation. Let's, in fact, let's go ahead and cut to a quick commercial break. When we get back, we're going to get right to the American Revolution 2.0. Uh, we'll be right back, guys. Do not go anywhere. Oath Keepers is a nonpartisan association of current active duty military, reserve, guard, veterans, peace officers, and firefighters will fulfill the oath we swore with the support of like-minded citizens who take an oath to stand with us to support and defend the constitution against all enemies foreign and domestic so help us god join us at oathkeepers.org Support on the move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services, from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. Broadcasting from deep within occupied territory on the far left coast, you're listening to On the Move with Mac Worley III. Stand up, speak out, and get on the move. And now your host, Mac Worley III. So, who would stand to gain? if there was another American Revolution, if we cast off the chains of our government and we all finally said enough is enough, who would, who would stand to gain? And with this question comes quite a bit of dialogue. So let's first take a look at Occupy Wall Street. Okay, and even let's look at the the Ferguson riots, the the riots that we've just recently seen. You know, these are these are all situations that were touted by, surprisingly, by by many people that I am affiliated with. You know, a, a lot of people that I was talking with that said that you know this is good, this is good. We need a new American Revolution. And this is good. Uh, however, when you look at these movements, all right, and let's just, for the sake of argument, let's just look at Occupy Wall Street. You know, it may have started out w as something good, you know, against corporatism, where crony corporatism, where, the, you know, the, the banks, Wall Street, uh, e industry, business, they're all colluding with the government to get tax breaks. So, yeah, that's, that's wrong. You know, and they're doing it in a way that basically makes it a monopoly. And in our society, really, the only monopolies that exist are the ones that are in existence because the government has created them. Government-assisted monopolies is what we're talking about. So, yeah, Occupy Wall Street, I, I support standing against corporatism, crony corporatism. I support that. However, look at what happened to that movement. Look at that movement. It's It's... Really, it's a, just a bunch of dirty hippies, you know, peeing on the sidewalk, camping out. I mean, that is what that movement turned into. And, I mean, it got a lot of steam, and there's still the infrastructure set up there by the left because the left has, has used that 
and they will continue to use it. And now they've used that same infrastructure to fund, support, and try to instigate more hands up, don't shoot propaganda movements, which we all know hands up, don't shoot is based off of a lie. I mean, it's just not even factually accurate. So I digress. Let's go back to the topic at hand, though. Who stands to gain? At this point, I do not think that a American revolution will, in the least, be beneficial for the American people. At least those of us who, who are not socialists and do not want communism. Uh, I absolutely wholeheartedly believe that if there was an American revolution, especially something emotionally charged, you know, it, it would immediately be hijacked by the left. They have the infrastructure. And if it's an emotional cause, all right, such as oh, we're tired of police brutality and because of this we're going to revolt. Well, according to the, dec the Declaration of Independence, we do have the right to alter or abolish any government as we see fit. And and that's that's fine. And I believe that is accurate. We absolutely do. This country, all governments are created based upon the consent of the people. Now, that consent might not be might not be respected and the people might not be asserting that consent. But a government cannot govern a people that do not consent and will not consent. Keep this in mind. Everything that the government has, it has stolen from you. Everything that the government creates, <laughs> let's, let's, uh, I was joking. The government doesn't create. The government steals. That's what the government does. The government doesn't create jobs. But what they're great at doing is destroying jobs and turning them into public sector jobs and what we can guarantee if a job that was private and is now public sector we can guarantee that that job will be less productive it'll be more wasteful and it won't get the job done nearly as well as the private sector job because the people working in the private sector job have something to gain i.e. money maybe they get a promotion Maybe it's their business, and if their business is successful, or if they waste less, they save more. <laughs> Those are all simple benefits. But in terms of this American Revolution, you know, if if it was something emotionally charged, like police brutality, we're talking racial lines, how we've been seeing right now with the whole Ferguson, Mike Brown kind of thing, it, I, I do not see this ending well for us libertarians conservatives i do not see this ending well the reason being is that it doesn't take any information whatsoever for you to scream that somebody's racist it doesn't take any kind of analysis any kind of real deep thought that's what you do when you're losing an argument or when you don't even understand the argument you start screaming down your opponents what we need in this country is an intellectual revolution we have to we absolutely have to convert more people to our side we can win like that because our arguments are sound the philosophy of liberty you know voluntarism it, it, we're you know we do not want to harm anyone we just want to be left alone we don't want to deprive anyone of our uh, of their rights and we don't want them to try to deprive us of ours as long as we're not hurting others, we should be left the hell alone. I think, for the most part, most people that I know just want to be left the hell alone. And it's really upsetting how easy it is for people to fall into the trap, the government trap, of where, you know, it, it ought to be a law. There ought to be a law against that. Especially when you're talking about something that there were no victims you know, if if there is no victim, in my personal opinion, there should be no crime. And we're living in a state right now where it just seems like we are creating more and more felons. Things that were misdemeanors are now felonies, and with felons comes less rights. You know, if it, it, you, you lose your right to vote, even after you get out of prison, you, you've lost your right to vote, and you've lost your right to bear firearms. Those are extremely important, and if you're on some kind of probation, uh, especially as a felon, uh, you you may have to be submit to searches or seizures along those lines. So, 
you know, it's 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 pretty crazy. So a- anyway, you know, back to the American Revolution topic. I, I I personally don't think that that there are enough people in this country. I believe there are so many apathetic people that are not educated on on economics, on the Constitution. What are the limits? Most people don't even know, and you know, this isn't anything that I'm I'm judging them on. I want to be clear. I'm not I'm not making fun of people or belittling people who don't know these things because we're all on a on a different you know timeline here of of where we are, what we've researched, what we've come up to, you know, as far as what we've learned. You know, personally, I have been on a journey here trying to just get my hands on as much information as possible learn how our government works learn about the constitution economics you know it, the the war on drugs i want to understand it i want to understand prohibition history you know th- these kind of things are so important to me now i i am hungry for knowledge i'm just devouring everything i can when it comes to these topics and you know i can't expect everyone out there and i absolutely don't expect everyone out there to to know everything and to be exactly where I am right now. And, you know, additionally, there are people that are further along than I am that understand things better than I do. And I don't expect that I'm the smartest person in the room either. So it's th- this level of, of what we all know, it's, it creates diversity of thought, which is something I talk about very often. But right now we have to help educate others. You know, talk to our friends, talk to our families, get on the move, get out there, get active, find something in your community that you can work on and start teaching about that. But before you can teach, you have to learn. So even if you don't know everything about it, learn, learn it, pick whatever, whatever drives you, whatever motivates you, whatever you think can help out the cause of liberty, of voluntarism, whatever it is, just pick a cause because something big you know something that is an emotional especially through force or rioting rioting is not going to save our country rioting will never save our liberties right rioting is what you do when a plan has fallen through something has gone wrong and and you see all of these these uh these riots that that, that have been in the news recently not maybe not all of them i can't say that for sure but a lot of them start out as peaceful protests. I was reading an article the other day that, you know, an otherwise peaceful protest ended with 72 arrests. I believe it was in Cleveland, if I'm not mistaken. And how is that a peaceful... I don't know the ins and outs. I didn't read the whole story, I will tell you. But what I can see, and I'm seeing a pattern, is these leftists go out there and they start these protest rallies, which they have a right to do, but the crowd gets into this mob mode where they just lose their freaking minds. They get out there and and people who normally wouldn't throw a brick at a car are out there throwing a brick at a car because they're in a crowd of people and everyone else is doing it and they think they can get away. They think they have safety in numbers. That is not the kind of environment that we need to push the dial of liberty forward. That is absolutely the wrong environment. We'll end up being way worse off than we are right now if we allow that to take hold. I mean, we've got we've got a lot of things going against us when you think about it. As far as the infrastructure set up from the left, they have so many nanny state groups. You know, Moms Demand Action is out there trying to come after your guns. We've got Bloomberg, billionaire, Amazon billionaires, who apparently they can own hardcore military equipment like jets. And I, I don't mean like a jet engine. I mean like an entire freaking jet. They own a airplane jet. <sighs> Billionaire. But he also donated to uh, to take away your rights uh, because he was helping fund I-594 so in Washington State. Uh, which, by the way, coming to a city and state near you, everyone, uh, please uh, be prepared and diligent about that. Find out what's going on in your legislature. It's happened in Oregon now. They got Oregon, and uh, you know Chuck Riley. We got to we got to help uh, uh, recall him. But these kind of things, they already have the infrastructure set up to capitalize on any kind of uh, of of turmoil. You know, it, the left is who benefits when it comes out of these kind of things. You know, we need to look at the the things that are out right now, 
show our argument to the American people of why it ought to be different and and and, and change it that way. That is going to be the only way that we are going to, to be able to turn that dial of liberty in our direction anyway. <clears throat> I absolutely do not think that that an American revolution at this point would be beneficial. And additionally, I just want to talk to, to those out there who, who disagree with me because I know that our message resonates. You know, it, me being personally as a younger kid, I, I, I was liberal, you know, I, I, and I wouldn't really call myself a Democrat, but I was a young, dumb liberal. And I thought I knew everything until I realized I didn't. And then I started becoming more and more conservative. And as I became conservative, coming from a liberal background, I, I did not uh, really agree with everything that conservatives stand for. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, for the longest time I called myself a moderate and I didn't know what the hell that meant either. So uh, I was, you know, I'm trying to figure out where I stand geopolitically. And then I discovered the Libertarian Party and... You know, I, I don't really consider myself a full-fledged big L libertarian, but I, I like to follow, you know, 90% or so of libertarian philosophy. And I, I look at myself as a, a, a social liberal and a fiscal conservative, and I think that many of you out there would probably give yourself that designation. I think that many people who listen to this program probably do. So, you know, I can tell you that coming from the left... It, it, you know, and and I saw those things. I was, I was a part of some of those things. You know, that, that the left was, and I saw it, and I said, okay, well, let's look at the argument on the other side because that's how I am. I'm open minded. Uh, that's that's how I am. I don't, I I don't lock into a side of a debate and, and block out all new information. You know, so. I thought I stood on one side, and then I started listening to the arguments, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, those guys do make a lot of sense. And then after a while, I realized that I'm standing on the wrong side. And, you know, this was, I was young. I was really young back then. I was like 18, you know. So it's it's taken a long time for me to get where I am. And, and I personally, you know, have, have worked at it. So to imagine that the vast majority of Americans are where you are, especially if you've put in any work whatsoever at educating yourself on, on liberty related topics is, is out of the, out of question. It's, it, it, that did not happen. People are not out there researching economics, you know, <laughs> unless they have a genuine interest in it. They're not, you know, most people, and this is what I have noticed from my time, and I've traveled all around, okay? I, I mean, I, I lived in Ohio, I lived in Texas, lived in Wyoming, lived in Washington, now I'm living in Kentucky, all right? One thing that I have realized in my time traveling around is that people just want to be left the hell alone. They don't want other people telling them how to live their lives. And this is something that is interesting because it's a, it's a weird dynamic that people have. One person who says, you know, the government should not be able to tell you what you can do in the sanctity of your home may then turn around and say, well, there ought to be a law against that, you know, and this is what we were talking about before. If, if there is no victim, there should not be a law against it. And even if, you know, even if you have good justification or if it's for public safety, you know, the government is not supposed to be. Uh, the, the nanny state. It's not supposed to be your babysitter. The government is not there to protect you. In fact, they have no legal obligation to do so. So just remember that. that the government does not have the obligation to protect you. So why would you give someone who would have essentially ultimate authority over you to... It, it, why would you give them all of this power when they have no legal authority to actually use it to your benefit? So, or legal obligation to use it to your benefit. Anyway, this is just my thoughts on it. I would love to hear what you guys have to say. If you disagree with me, please give us a call. I want to hear what you have to say. I'd like to hear what, you know, I'd like to pick your brain on it and hear both sides of the argument here. Uh, anyway, our number of the show is 360-450-5625. Again, that's 360-450-5625. And we'll be right back after this break. Don't go anywhere. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. 
pledging my life, my fortune, and my sacred honor. So help me God. Join us at OathKeepers.org. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashawurley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, Worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. Broadcasting from deep within occupied territory on the far left coast. You're listening to On the Move with Mac Worley the Third. Stand up, speak out, and get on the move. But now your host, Mac Worley the Third. Hello, Mac Pack. We're back from break here, and um, when we last left, we were talking about uh, basically my opinion on a new American revolution, and uh, I would love to hear from you guys. Feel free to join the conversation. The number to the show is 360-450-5625. Again, 360-450-5625. And uh, let's see here. we got some other topics I want to get to. Uh, before we go into the Rand Paul Patriot Act conversation, i got some random articles that I, I want to talk to you guys about because I think they're particularly interesting. So uh, first up, we have something pretty hilarious, I think. This has got to be a joke. It, it literally has to be a joke. At least I think it is. Uh, of course, there we go. We had an ad pop up. All right. Uh, so this is a story from Breitbart.com written by Nick Hallett uh, on the 23rd of May, 2015. Uh, you must be joking. PETA investigates Australian farmer for verbally abusing sheep. You heard that right. Verbally abusing sheep. So apparently these these sheep must have some very you know tender emotions. They must may wear their emotions on their sleeves because they they got very offended apparently. And PETA, uh, if you're not familiar with PETA, it's uh you know it, it's not what it sounds like. Pita, it sounds like a delicious bread. No, no, no. It is not that. Uh, it is people for the ethical treatment of animals, if I'm remembering correctly. So, now, this is this is astounding to me. You Verbally abused sheep. I don't know if anyone has explained this to Pita, but sheep don't understand English. So, it doesn't really matter what you say to a sheep. Because they're they're not really going to understand you anyway. Uh, now, I can understand physical v- abuse. I, you know, nobody wants to see an animal suffering or be being beaten. You know, that's that's just not nice. But verbal abuse is that is that really a thing when it comes to animal protection groups? Anyway, let me read you the article. The Times says that people for the ethical treatment of animals lodged a complaint against Ken Turner after an employee was filmed by an undercover op- operative using bad language in front of his sheep. Mr. Turner said the allegation was that bad language was used by an employee on the property in front of the sheep and that they could have been offended by the use of bad language. PETA submitted the complaint to Australia's RSPCA, who confirmed they had investigated. The case collapsed, however, after it became clear the footage would not be legally admissible. The farmer said he didn't know if the sheep had their feelings hurt by the incident. I still haven't had had a sheep come to me to complain. They didn't even look offended to me after they were shorn. <laughs> Yesterday, Breitbart, Breitbart London reported how... PETA 
also want, uh, wanted Britain's oldest pub, Ye Old Fighting Cocks, to change its name as it was offensive to chickens. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if chickens can read. I mean, I'm not a, a Rhodes Scholar or anything. You know, I didn't win a, a Pulitzer Prize or anything. But I, to my knowledge, chickens cannot read. Uh, Mimi. Beck Heiser, Hiker, something like that. The organizer's director said that changing the name to Ye Old Clever Cox wouldn't reflect today's rejection of needless violence and help, or I'm sorry, would help. <laughs> gosh, I can't read. Ref, uh, it would reflect today's rejection of needless violence and help celebrate the chickens as the intelligent, sensitive, and social animals they are. However, local brand uh, branded the the move. Uh, locals branded the move bonkers. There we go. Ugh, I have trouble reading right now. Alrighty, so, um, anyway, that was one just randomly weird article. Hey, what do you guys think about that? I mean, I honestly think that we're, we're getting a little too far. And, uh, I have another article here upon request from, uh, one of our listeners. Uh, I want to talk about airsoft type weapons. Uh, and personally, I'm not an airsoft person. I don't, I don't really airsoft. I don't know much about it. But what I do know is about people getting harassed, uh, by police and when they're when they're in violation of no law so when you're when you're being harassed and you're being searched and uh you, you have your things going gone through in a place where you're allowed to be with things that you're allowed to have and they still stop and harass you and violate your fourth amendment your fifth amendment right uh if you had a set a, a firearm maybe it was a second amendment right so i i know about open carry uh, is is particularly what i'm talking about so this was in cleveland ohio on uh January 29th, 2015, and uh, let's see, this is by Corey Schaefer on Cleveland.com. A Cleveland man denied charges that he bra he had brandished a f a, an airsoft-type gun and caused public alarm inside Tower City Center Monday. Robert Lavender Houston, age 18, was arrested on misdemeanor charges of carrying a facsimile Weapon and criminal trespassing. That sounds very familiar, except for the uh, facsimile, facsimile weapon. Uh, an off-duty Cleveland police officer working paid security said he saw Lavender Houston brandishing a short-barreled uh, Uma Rex XBG airsoft-type gun at the mall at 1 p.m., according to court and police documents. The officer, along with an off uh, with an on-duty officer and a police super supervisor, took Lavender Houston into custody at 1.05 p.m., so five minutes after he saw him brandishing the gun. Lavender Houston was banned from the mall on December 11, 2014, for six months, according to court records, so apparently he's allowed back in by now. Um, or at least almost. Yeah, his, his ban is almost up. Anyway, he pled uh, not guilty to possessing certain weapons in a public place and criminal trespass, both misdemeanors. So, certain weapons in a pl public place. I don't know what the laws are pertaining to that, but that sounds pretty, pretty crappy right there because uh, I, I don't know, you know, if, if there was a law that says, you know, you can't have a facsimile weapon of some sort and and he he pled not guilty so he's saying that he didn't point it at anyone and uh you know this is basically a toy just just a fyi this is a toy gun uh i i know maybe airsoft there's out there probably would not like that uh, me calling it a toy gun it looks real but it is not and that is the that's the thing it's a toy gun you know, I I don't know if that's offensive. I don't know anything about airsoft. I'll just say, but the the point is right to shoot people with it, right? So you shoot people with toy guns. That's or e even a paintball gun, in my opinion, is a toy gun. It's it's you play with it. You don't play with real guns. So, you know, I, this would be like the equivalent of them saying that you can't have a super soaker in a mall and you pointed a super soaker at somebody and now you're getting arrested because you're in possession of certain weapons in a public place. And criminal trespass. By the way, all right. If they if they talk to him at 1 p.m. and they arrest him at five at 1:05 p.m. and they say about 1 p.m. So give or take, it could have, it could have been a little more. It could have been a little less than five minutes. Within five minutes, this man was criminal trespassed from a public mall and then arrested for violating that. You have to give these people an opportunity to to leave. 
You know, th- this is this is su- such a similar situation as far as, uh, and I don't know. I'm just looking into it. I have absolutely no idea. And I'm not saying this guy is innocent. I'm not saying he's guilty. I'm just saying that I understand if he was in the mall with a you know with a a toy gun essentially is what that is and it looks real and the officers got worked up oh my god oh my god he's got a gun oh my god and he maybe he wasn't even brand brandishing means pointing it at somebody threatening somebody with it gesturing with the gun something you have to do some kind of conduct so if he just had it i I don't know if this what kind of gun this is in fact uh let me i'm gonna open up a tab on the link for what it said this is uh i'm looking at it Looks like a pistol. Yeah, it's a pistol. So I don't know if he had it in a holster or if he was carrying it. Uh, regardless, the man says that he did not uh, point. Or he was not brandishing it. So I don't know if he if just having it in your hand as far as what the, the courts will decide. Uh, this would be interesting to hear what happened with this. Uh, but he pled not guilty. Uh, and... Again, if he was not allowed to leave, if they were harassing him and stopping him from leaving, then that is that is messed up. That what happened to me when I was unlawfully arrested, they told me to leave the property, and I'm standing on a public sidewalk yelling over, "Hey, my car is in that parking lot. How do you how do you want me to go home? I just want to go home. How do you expect me to get to my car if you won't let me go in that parking lot?" They wouldn't let me go one way down the public sidewalk, and when I attempted to go the other way down the public sidewalk. I was arrested for trespassing, which you can't do on a public sidewalk. So, I, I mean, I, I think, for in my personal opinion, especially when firearms or the 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 thought that there is a firearm involved, uh, it, you know, is involved with the situation. I think that many unexperienced police officers or police officers that just don't see that kind of thing very often. I think that maybe they they get overexcited, overzealous, and no matter what you say, you know you're in the wrong, and they're gonna bust you basically. So, but that's not all. That's not all police officers. You know that I think these are just the the ones that, you know, maybe not be very experienced with this kind of thing or know what to do, have poor training, uh, and you know it's it's one thing if you have an oath breaker in your police department. It, it's it's one thing if if this oath breaker is. You know, doesn't respect your Second Amendment right and, or your right to open carry or, or any other right that you may possess. There are so many of them. However, if the police department itself holds their officers accountable and trains these officers on what they expect out of them, it'll be less likely for these things to happen. I think ultimately when we're talking about these kind of things, we're talking about uh, police that are not being, one, held accountable for their action, and two, uh, they are not being properly trained at what is expected of them and what they can and can't do. So uh, again, I'm not call, I'm not casting judgment on, in this situation. I do not know what happened. All I know is what is in here. According to the police report, let's see here. Uh, police responded uh, to a November 23. Uh, oh, that's a different article here. That different thing. They went to something else here. Uh, okay, so he pled not guilty to both misdemeanors in Cleveland Municipal Court uh, Wednesday. He paid 10% of his $1,000 bond and is scheduled to appear in court again. Police responding to a November 23rd report of a man with a gun pulled up less than 10 feet from Tamar and opened fire within two seconds when they said they thought he was reaching for the handle of a gun. Ohio Representative Alice Reese, a Cincinnati Democrat, proposed a state law that uh, the day of Tamar's death that would require all toy, uh, toy guns to be sold in Ohio to be made with bright colors. Oh, great. So, yeah, if you're trying to actually have a realistic uh, war with airsoft guns, you're, you're going to have a bright orange gun. Uh, you know, tip on your gun or be completely bright orange, something along those lines. Yeah, Democrats trying to, you know, make sure that you 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 have gun control on toy guns now. Uh, let's see, we got California Democrat U.S. Senator Barbara Boxer in December asked the Consumer Product Safety Commission to consider requiring all toy guns, including BB guns and rubber pellet guns, to be painted brightly or carry noticeable fluorescent strips. Now. There is another story here that uh, you know I, I I have to get to because it's also in Cleveland, and uh, this one is 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 very upsetting to me, and I think this goes back to the conversation of holding our police officers accountable, um, <clears throat> and I understand 
how dangerous the job is as a law enforcement officer. I, I absolutely do, and I am one of the most supportive oath-keeping law enforcement or police peacekeepers out there. I support these people. <coughs> I don't support the oath keep or the, the oath breakers, though. So here's an article on nydailynews.com. A Cleveland boy, age 12, dies after being shot by officer for brandishing replica handgun. And this is the case that they're talking about, Tamara Rice. The child was shot in the torso Saturday afternoon at a playground and died early Sunday, uh, his family said. A witness called police and said the child was waving the weapon and scaring the expletive out of everybody. Police said the child reached for the weapon in his waistband when approached by police but did not point the airsoft handgun at the officers. So, this is particularly disturbing. And, you know, I, the, the left is going to get on to the, the whole thing of where it's, oh, this is racial, this is racial, you know, because he's a black boy. And they're going to say, he, you know, if it was a white kid, he would have never been killed. You know, and, and in fact, I think it actually says it in this article here. I think I've I, I, I skimmed this article earlier and they said something about that. So, okay, yeah, here we go. Uh, always kill a black kid, right? She, uh, she said, and I don't know who's saying this. I'll get to this in a second. But the point is, is that our police officers, they, they aren't out there thinking about your safety in terms of every interaction with with the people that they 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 go against basically um let me explain this a little better uh, again they have no no actual obligation legally to protect you so this is a supreme court ruling you don't have to take my word for it go look it up if you do not believe me type in in google supreme court ruling police no obligation to protect okay uh, you'll find it you will find it and it's disturbing to me because these people are out there with the intent of going home. That's it's such a common saying, you know, no matter what happens, we're going to go home. I'm going to do what I got to do to go home. I hear that from police officers all the time. You know, officer safety, public safety, oh, goodness, national security. We'll get to that, too, with the, the Rand Paul conversation today. But in terms of officer safety, we are seeing... A situation where officers are, you know, they shoot first, they shoot later, they shoot again, and if anybody's alive afterwards, they maybe they'll ask a few questions afterwards, you know, because they're not taking any chances. They will go home, and this is not all police officers. There are good police officers out there, but I'm talking about the bad ones. You know, this little boy, he didn't even point this replica at a police officer. Didn't even point it. He reached for the weapon in his waistband when approached by the police, but did not point the airsoft handgun at any officers, and he was shot. And they operate, they're operating like every contact, they can die. And obviously, every contact, they can. However, they're acting as if they're in a war zone. And we see this with the militarization of the police. You know, they're out there driving freaking tanks and Humvees down our streets. And they think that's acceptable. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. This kid was 12 years old. He hasn't even begun to live. And he died. And again, let's let's talk about this whole a whole person who, who a witness calling into the police said the child was waving a weapon around and scaring the crap out of everybody. I believe in the, the report, he said that, uh, uh, let's see, there's a guy in here with a pistol. It's probably fake, but he's pointing it at everybody. And this is one, according to one of the 911 calls released, it's probably fake. You know what? It's scaring the, the crap out of everybody. This is crazy. He called the police on a kid with a toy gun knowing that it was probably fake. The officers were told that it's probably fake. And they responded like it was real. And they killed a 12-year-old. Now, I don't care what race he was. He could have been white. I'd still be talking about it. If I found the story, I would be talking about it. He could be Asian. He could be whatever. It doesn't matter. He could be an alien from outer space. And if this happened to them, I'd talk about it on this show. This isn't about race. This is about police and government. 
and really both of them are inextricably linked when you when when you think that the government is different than the police you are wrong you're wrong you're wrong the government is the police in fact the government is I'm sorry, the police is the government, and the police are the enforcement arm of the government. So whatever these legislators are doing in your 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 town's capitol buildings, whatever whatever is going on in Washington, D.C., all of these laws are being enforced at the local level by local police officers. They are the enforcement arm. So this is why it's important that we have oath keepers in our police departments. Because they need to be able to stand up and say, no, we're not going to do that. No, it's not my job to do that. No, that would violate somebody's rights. No, that's a 12-year-old. And he may, we were told in the call that we got that it may be a fake gun. They were told that it may be a fake gun. And then additionally, let's, let me just point out here, and I have to, I have to mention what happened to me. I was out walking around for about a half hour. It was maybe a little more than a half hour before the police even showed up. All right? So who walks around for a half hour with a gun if they're out there trying to hurt somebody? Why would I be out there advertising my presence? No shooter in the history of this country has ever walked around for 30 minutes and then went on a killing spree. So my question is, and I don't know. This is an actual question I have here. Uh, when did this kid first get there? When was the 911 call made? And when did the police show up? How much time passed? Because if it was like my situation, if it took a half hour for police to get there, do you really think that there's a threat at this point? The kid's been out there waving the gun around for 30 minutes. It's obviously a fake gun at this point. Why would you shoot the kid? It is a kid. Maybe they haven't been taught how to deal with police officers to not get shot. And that's, that's what you have to do. Now, when I say you have to be taught how to deal with police officers, it's not because you have to respect their authority, you got to respect the badge, the position, their governmental rank, whatever, whatever that is. No, you have to know how to deal with police officers to not get shot. That's the only reason why I didn't get shot when I was dealing with police officers out there uh, when they arrested me. They pulled up on me, had seven guns pointed at my chest. AR-15s, shotguns, handguns. I'm over here about to pee myself. This is crazy. I'm, out, I'm just out for a walk talking to people about gun rights. And all of a sudden, I turn around and I got guns pointed all over the place at me. I didn't threaten anyone. I didn't joke or gesture with my weapon. I wasn't brandishing my weapon, but yet... This is how they responded. Guns blazing. You know, it, it, it's like it's the biggest crime of the century. And everyone, it, everybody wanted to get involved in it and, and be involved in the takedown. You know, it's, it's insane. It reminds me, I don't know if any of you are uh, Arlo Guthrie fan, fans, but uh, I'm a big fan of Arlo Guthrie's Alice's Restaurant. And uh, it reminds me of the Alice's Restaurant, restaurant, <laughs> restaurant Massacre where, uh, <laughs> you know, he, he goes out. And uh, he, he wanted to do a good thing for his, um, his friend, Alice. And, and uh, he wanted to basically empty out her trash. She had saved a bunch of trash for a real long time because she took out the pews in this church that she lived in. And he emptied it all out and threw it in the back of a VW microbus. And he went out and he was going to find a place to dump the garbage. And he went to the town dump. And it was Thanksgiving. And it was closed. And then he goes and he dumps the, the garbage down on the side of a cliff where there was already a pile of garbage. Anyway, long story short, and it is a very long story if you know what I'm talking about. If you've heard the song, you'll know it's like 20-something 20, 20 minutes, something like that. But uh, excellent and hilarious. If you haven't heard it, you should check it out. Uh, it starts this big investigation where the, you know the, they arrested him. You know, they threw him in a jail cell. They took away his belt so he wouldn't hang himself in the toilet seat so he wouldn't bang himself over the head and drown. Uh, and and all sorts of stuff. They they had uh, you know color glossy per, uh, pictures with circles and arrows and and a paragraph on the back of each one explaining what each one is to be used to evidence against him in the court of law, and all this stuff. And uh, you know it's it's the biggest crime of the century and it's littering. You know and it's this small little town. So I think that there is a lot of 
of situations like this in police departments where people are so excited to use all their fancy new cop equipment. Woohoo! We got all this stuff that the government just sent us, the federal government. They just sent us all these these fancy new toys. Let's use them. I, that guy has an AR-15 out. He's, he's walking down the street. Let's go ahead and grab our AR-15 and point it at him because I don't ever get to pick this thing up. It just sits in my cruiser. Yes! Hoorah! You know, that these guys are, are excited about it. And I get the excitement. I was in the military, by the way, and there was times where I responded to security alarms, and I was pretty excited. I was gung-ho, man. I was ready to go. I was ready to, you know, chew bullets and spit lead, man. I was, I was ready to go. So I will tell you, I know that feeling. But when that feeling is, is being perpetrated, perpetrated by our police departments against the citizenry, you know, at the sake of uh, public safety, when when really they're causing panic, they're causing commotion by showing up guns blazing. I think it's it's something that we really need to address. I think that this this whole anti police movement is it's headed the wrong way. You know, I, I I think that it's we need more accountability, but not with the federal government. Oh my. You know, in my opinion, and actually this will lead us to another story that I wanted to get to here. Um, this was brought to our attention by one of our listeners, uh, and this is particularly something that we, we need to discuss on this same conversation. Uh, Obama puts focus on police success in struggling city in New Jersey. <clears throat> this article title was actually changed several times here. Um, this is on New York Times, written by Julie Hirschfield Davis and Michael D. Shear on May 18, 2015. Essentially, I'm not going to read the article. You can check it out on the New York Slimes yourself. But uh, anyway, in this article, Obama starts talking about basically, hey, maybe you know the police shouldn't have militarized weapons. Because what, what happens now is the federal government, they have all these surplus weapons and equipment that they have left over, and vehicles especially too. They got all these armored personnel carriers and, and all sorts of other shenanigans uh, that, that they have left over from the wars that we've been, been doing here. So uh, the war on terror. And um, what they're doing is they're, they're giving these uh, all they have to do is pay shipping to local police departments. So it is, uh, it, it's, it's fascinating that you know small little towns that have never had a need for something like this will take it. They'll pay the money for shipping because it's a great deal. Yeah, why wouldn't you want some armored personnel carrier? Oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be a great toy to have. Awesome. You know, but the problem is, is that these people are now so excited to use them that it becomes an issue. So uh, Obama's, uh, this is almost a joke. Obama's talking about how the military or military weapons and equipment should not be uh, in the hands of police. Maybe it's kind of like it's. Uh, let's, let's have a debate about. It. Let's talk about it. Yeah, right. This is coming from the same guy who who said that he wanted to create a domestic army in violation of the Posse Comitatus Act. By the way, uh, to to basically. Uh, be as strong as our military. In fact, I have a clip. I'll go ahead and play it real quick for you so you can hear it right from the horse's mouth. We cannot continue to rely only on our military in order to achieve the national security objectives that we've set. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong, just as well-funded. Okay, so... Now, this is in direct violation of the Posse Comitatus Act, something along those lines, but uh, Homeland Security standing up. It's becoming more and more of a standing army here on American soil, not to police us. I mean, it's, it's not really meant to, uh, to, to protect us. Again, they don't have the obligation, but to police us. And it's important to note, and, and you, you have to understand this, the purpose of your military is to protect you from enemies and when you start using military or military equipped police to to police your streets you are basically saying that the civilians the citizens are your enemy the enemy of the government and that is why we have the posse comitatus act that's why we don't we don't want a standing army here on american soil and let me ask you here, because this, this to me, I think is where this is headed. And this may sound conspiratorial. It probably is. Probably. Uh, 
But um, where do you think this is going? If Obama actually did demilitarize our uh, our police departments, do you think that would be good for us? I don't know because I don't think that he's genuine. And for me, what I see is a nationalization of our police departments where you see Attorney General Eric Holder coming in all the time to investigate. Oh, my gosh, what's going on over here? What's going on over here? Is that racist? Is that racist? Oh, my God, they're racist. Everybody's racist. Yeah. So this is uh, this is what's going on. And what we're doing is we're putting more jurisdiction and in, in creating a precedent where the federal government can get involved in jurisdictions that they have no jurisdiction in. So just for example, let's look at like the, the JFK assassination. OK, there's a lot of conspiracy theories with this, but I'm not talking about that. Uh, there was a, a an issue because it was a, a murder when JFK was killed. It was a murder in Dallas. So it fell within the jurisdiction, uh, jurisdiction of Texas be- for murder. But the federal government's like, oh my God, that's the president. We want in. And there was all these different things that, that they were doing to basically thwart the investigators in Texas. Uh, and this is where some of the conspiracies came from. I, I'm not even essentially 100% privy to all the JFK conspiracy information. But anyway, I digress. The point is, is that the federal government didn't have the jurisdiction and they aren't supposed to. The federal government isn't supposed to be in charge of every single police department and, and basically micromanage and come in and, and investigate unless there is some kind of complaint that there is an issue within that department. Then they come in and check it out. But they're not supposed to just come in before there was, all the investigation is even done. They're not, even, they're not supposed to do that. But I see, what I see now is the federalization of our police departments. And this is scary. This is uber scary. And you should be worried about this. I don't know what Obama is planning on doing. He could be planning on essentially getting rid of the police departments locally and replacing them with a federal homeland security police officer under federal jurisdiction if that was the case that would be scary because you'd have a standing army on u.s soil controlled directly by the president of the united states receiving orders directly by the president of the united states and that is something to be worried about I think it is is essentially one of the scariest things that we can deal with in this, this scenario you talk about Libertarian philosophy. Let, let's actually talk about one part of libertarian philosophy, decentralization. Why is that important? Why is it important to have decentralization in your government? Because you don't want all of the authority and power being uh, put into just a few hands. That is the issue. So if you have just a few people in command and control over a standing army in U.S. soil receiving orders directly from the top. I think that's a recipe for disaster. That's a recipe for us to, to lose our freedoms. That's a recipe for a police state. That's something I don't want to be a part of. And uh, I don't think our founders would either. I think that local level is where the police departments need to be held at and uh you know i am for demilitarizing our police um and i do support oath keeping peace officers people are out there putting their lives on the line to to keep their community safe who are not saying that they'll do whatever they have to do i don't care who uh, whose rights i have to violate just to get home you know I heard something the other day that stuck with me, and it's something that I want to share with you guys. Uh, it's a quote, and uh, I can't. I wish I could remember who said it. It's not mine. Uh, I think I maybe heard it from a movie, but um, basically the quote was: "the The wounds of honor are self inflicted." You know. So, and in terms of uh, of with the police officers, you know, the wounds of honor are self inflicted. If if a police officer is out there doing the right thing, you know, and and they get they get injured on the job, they're trying to keep their community safe. You know, that is one of those wounds of honor that are self-inflicted. You know, maybe somebody did it to them, but you know, just like people on Memorial Day, we're talking about today. You know, our, our veterans who who signed that blank check, and 
they they end up paying the ultimate price. You know, they they received a wound of honor. And I I think I think that's a pretty powerful statement. You know, I I, I, I it's so easy to dogpile on police. You know, with this anti-police movement, and I don't want to participate in that. I am not anti-police. I'm anti-law enforcement without any regard of the Constitution without any regard of your obligations to your community as a as a peace officer that's what i'm anti but i'm very pro peacekeeping oath keepers who are in our our military and our police departments anyway uh we're going to go ahead and cut to a quick commercial break when we come back we're going to have more on this we have a bunch of other articles we're going to get to i want to get to uh our weekly defender i also want to get to a conversation we had about indian prisoner rights uh i want to talk about uh obviously uh rand paul's uh, block of the patriot act we're going to talk about that give you my opinion on that and uh, an article i have that is uh, about an infuriating american town and uh, all the tickets that they're writing so you guys don't want to go anywhere we'll be right back after these messages Oath Keepers is a nonpartisan association of current active duty military, reserve, guard, veterans, peace officers, and firefighters who will fulfill the oath we swore with the support of like-minded citizens who take an oath to stand with us to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So help us God. Join us at OathKeepers.org. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services, from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. Casting from deep within occupied territory on the far left coast. You're listening to On the Move with Mac Borley the Third. Stand up, speak out, and get on the move. But now your host, Mac Borley the Third. Back. All righty, so. We got a lot of topics to cover. We're going to get right to it. Let's pick and choose. Let's go into, uh, hmm. <laughs> okay, I got one I got to get to here. This is super important. It's actually a local issue here for me. Uh, there's a local family in Kentucky who has had their 10 children seized by the police. And many of you may have heard, you know, in the past I've, I've discussed uh, some some people who are in the process of fighting CPS, Child Protective Services, in many cases, you know, CPS is um, is doing the right thing. I hope. I hope. I give them the benefit of the doubt. In some cases, however, they are not. And it is become a revenue arm, much like the police departments have become uh, in our communities. So this is an article on Infowars.com written by Paul Joseph Watson. Police seized 10 children from an off-the-grid homeschool family in Kentucky on Wednesday after receiving an anonymous tip about the family's traditional lifestyle. The nightmare story began when sheriff's officers set up a blockade around Joe and Nicole Nog- Nogler's rural uh, property before entering the premises. Uh, eight of their children were out 
with their father, but uh, Nicole and two of her oldest were at home. Nicole attempted to drive away, but was subsequently stopped and arrested for resisting, attempting to prevent officers from taking her two boys away. And I think that's probably something that a lot of parents would do. So I don't even blame her for that. The sheriff then demanded Joe Nogler uh, turn over the other eight children by 10 a.m. the next day or face felony charges, an order with which he complied. They are an extremely happy family, said uh, said uh, uh, friend uh, Pace Ellsworth, who asserted that the Noglers were targeted because of their back-to-basics life and their decision to homeschool their children. Friends reported no concerns about how the, ch- uh, the children were being treated by their parents, who follow an education model called unschooling, where children or where their children decide their own curriculum based on subjects that interest them and what their strengths are. Uh, this is the natural way to live, said Ellsworth. It's actually a growing movement. They want to have a, a personal education and not a factory education. They are completely open about their life. Everyone is learning uh, by living. They are all extremely intelligent. The family's Facebook page, entitled... My Blessed Little Homestead is a charming testament to their way of life. The Nogler children are obviously living a blissful, free-range lifestyle amongst 26 acres of land in Breckenridge County. They frequently post pictures and videos of their children, animals, and off-the-grid life. Reports uh, reports off-the-grid news. A May 5th post showed a video of a toddler, Messiah, uh, learning to walk. On an April 24th post showed a happy family gathering around a campfire roasting marshmallows. They have set up a GoFundMe page to try to raise money for legal expenses. So I'm going to read that off to you right now, guys. Uh, right now, they have raised uh, $45,627, and they were trying to get $10,000. But you can still donate now, and I'm sure the the more money they have, the more they can fight. This is... Awesome. I am so happy that people are doing this. But the GoFundMe page is GoFundMe.com forward slash TZ4XNG. Very catchy. Easy to remember, right? TZ4XNG. What What'd you say? Oh, TZ4XNG. Oh, I didn't hear you. Can you say that again? TZ4XNG. Again, that's GoFundMe.com slash TZ4XNG. GoFundMe.com tz slash tz for x and g that is a, that is a just rolls right off the tongue right tz for x and g tz for x and g i do it like a robot tz for x and g sounds like it could be a robot name anyway enough of that that was fun uh now back to the article a website for the family spells out their plight with the heart of Wrenching words. This Kentucky family of 12, six dogs, two farm cats, and a few random farm animals was just torn apart. Their crime, living a simple back-to-basics life. So, I want to I wanna just talk about this for a second. I, obviously, this this didn't really explain a whole lot as to why, what they were charged with, what what was the reason for taking their children. We don't know. Uh, you know, According to the article, and I, I tried to contact this family, actually, uh, to have them on the show. Since they're local, I figured uh, it would be interesting. Uh, but, uh, yeah, they, they haven't got back to me yet. I'm going to keep trying to see if I can get them on the show. I would love to see if I can help get more you know, more exposure to their plight, but, uh, and also want to talk to them and hear their side of the story and, and hear it right from the horse's mouth, you know, what were their charges? What are they doing? What's the status of the case? Things along those lines. But let me just say at face value of this article, if these, these parents were, if there was some kind of charge that they're neglecting or abusing their children, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if that is the case or not. Uh, but if, if, this article is accurate that they were targeted simply because they have an off-the-grid lifestyle and in the way that they choose to educate their children, the state came in and decided to take them. Now, this is definitely an alternative way to live. Uh, unschooling, where and I actually I have some familiarity with this. I have a friend who uh, who basically does this kind of education with his kid, uh, where you know he basically teaches him things that he's interested in. He doesn't force him to learn things that he has no interest in, but he he at least shows him and presents things to them uh, and lets him decide for himself what he wants to learn. So. You know, it's, it's definitely an alternative, and it's not uh, it's not for everybody. You know, not every parent would want that, and it's, maybe it's not for every child either. But this family is doing it, and it apparently is working out if the article is accurate. So with that in mind, 
do you think that the government has a right and come a right to come in and tell you <coughs> excuse me how to educate your children and how you have to live I absolutely do not I don't think that they have the right to do this I think that if you know, first of all, my child is my child. I, I don't have a child for the record, so I don't have a dog in this fight. But this is mine. You know, this belongs to me. It does not take a, a village to raise a child. It takes a father and a mother to raise a child. I don't buy into this whole collectivism where everybody belongs to the community and we're all responsible to parent the children. No. Especially if your idea of parenting goes against what the parent, what the parents actually want for their children, then no, you do not have a say in this. The government certainly does not have a say. And what justification is it for the government to, to try to tell you how to educate your children? <clears throat> oh, I can tell you, it behooves the government to stop homeschooling, to stop unschooling movements. It behooves the government to. Continue to have your children in a public school where they're teaching you what is important, what you should learn, how you should think, things along those lines. Because, by the way, uh, the government just so happens to be the people in public schools that are responsible for teaching you about the Constitution, which is the very document that restricts their authority. So if they don't do a particularly great job of teaching the Constitution, which, I don't know, how, how did your school do? your public school do at teaching you the Constitution because I went to public school I didn't know anything about the Constitution at all I mean nothing I knew the First Amendment that was it and I knew it was you know in the 1700s that I didn't know anything until I started actually trying to research and learn for myself I didn't learn any of these things and it's because the federal government they don't want you to know they don't w it, it behooves them for you to be ignorant on on the document that restrains their authority. It behooves you to be ignorant on anything. As far, as far as the government is concerned, they want you to be dumb and complacent. They want you to be just a little cow, just sitting there chewing on your food, blankly staring at a wall, chewing on your food, looking at your TV, soaking that and soaking in those television rays, you know, getting eye cancer and <clears throat> you know, uh Keeping up with the Kardashians, watching your Monday night football, just not paying attention to what's going on in the government because that is is too much. They don't want you to think for yourself. You are a cow to them. You're cattle. You're revenue. That's what you are to your government. The government is not benevolent. The government looks at you as a cash-making cow. That's all you are. That's all you'll ever be to a government. So, why would we allow that kind of mentality, that kind of sickness into our homes, into our education? We shouldn't. They have no business, no authority, no right, no way. Anyway, uh, again, if you guys want to help out this family, you can go to their GoFundMe, GoFundMe.com slash TZ4XNG. Again, GoFundMe.com forward slash TZ4XNG. And they're up to $45,000 right now, so they're doing pretty well. They've raised that by, <coughs> let's see here, uh, 1,123 people in 17 days. Amazing. All right, so... Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next story. I'm going to go ahead and cut right into the uh, the lead story for today. Uh, this is Rand Paul's attempt, and I think his success, to block the extension of the Patriot Act. But let me ask you guys. Do you think this is professional showboating or showmanships as far as for uh, political games, uh, gamesmanship? Or do you think this is an actual attempt by Rand to dismantle the surveillance state? I'm going to go ahead and play the clip of him talking about it, and you guys can decide. Reserving the right to object, we have entered into a momentous debate. This is a debate about whether or not a warrant with a single name of a single company can be used to collect all the records, all of the phone records of all of the people in our country with a single warrant. Our forefathers would be aghast. One of the things they despised was general warrants. This is a debate that should be had, and the reason I am objecting 
is because I've made a very simple request to have amendments, to have them voted on, and to have a guarantee that they're voted on. I started out the day with a request for six amendments. I'm willing to compromise to having two amendments at a simple majority vote. I think that's a very reasonable position, and if we can't have that, and we can't have an extensive debate over something we've had four years to prepare for, I will object, and I do. I object. We'll be back in Sunday. All right, so that was Rand, and now here is Mitch McConnell. By the way, uh, you know what? Actually, I'll wait to give you my comment here on this, but I want you to hear what Mitch McConnell has to say. May the 31st, one more opportunity to act responsibly to not allow this program to expire. This is a high threat period, and we know what's going on overseas. We know what's been tried here at home. My colleagues, do we really want this law to expire? We've got a week to discuss it. We'll have one day to do it. So we better be ready next Sunday afternoon to prevent the country from being endangered by the total expiration of the program that we're all familiar with. Okay, so that was Senator Mitch McConnell. And uh, again, that was also... Oh, we're going to have another video play here if I don't close out of this here. All right, there we go. All right, so that was Senator Mitch McConnell... And he was also uh, preceded by um, Rand Paul. Sorry, I'm getting a little scatterbrained here. All right, uh, I want to comment on a couple different things. First of all, Rand Paul's uh, section of it. Uh, Do you believe that this is showmanship or is this an actual attempt to dismantle the surveillance state? Uh, So let me ask a couple questions before you answer that here. They've had four years to to work on this, as he said, uh, and... To my knowledge, Rand Paul has been a senator for at least that amount of time, if I'm not mistaken. So where where was he in this conversation prior to this? And how, how long, how many opportunities has he passed up to object? How many times has he has he not objected from this? I don't know. I, I I haven't I haven't been able to do the research yet on that. I'm going to. Uh, I'm interested in this because Rand is kind of an anomaly for me right now. I I don't really like him uh, because I think that he is playing political games uh, in the sake of liberty, under the name of liberty. I feel like he, when it is politically convenient for him, he will stand up and say, hey, libertarians, hey, conservatives, I'm against this stuff that you're against. And then at the same time, he'll go and make some backdoor deal with Mitch McConnell. But it's interesting here that him and Mitch, good old Mitch, are in opposition to one another right now. Uh, Rand is saying, hey, we need to talk about this. And Mitch McConnell is saying that uh, that they you know, they just need to pass it because we're in a high threat period. Well, crap. I mean, we've been in a high threat period since 9-11. And obviously we were in a high threat period prior to 9-11. Are we always going to be in a high threat period? Yes. Do you know why? Because it will always be some kind of threat out there. First of all, there's always going to be somebody that wants to kill us. But secondly, the government will always upplay the threats. We will always have this condition of fear bestowed upon us by the government. Oh, be af- be afraid of this. Be worried about that. These people are going to kill you. Those people are going to kill you. You have to give us more power. Give us more power. We need to see everything. Ah! This is upsetting to me that people still fall for this crap. I don't, I, I mean, it's been since 2001. It's been 14 years. 14 years after 9 11, and people are still buying this load of crap national security excuse. Load of crap. And, and also, I just, I have to, I have to point out. <coughs> The uh, the director or whoever of uh, of the CIA, whoever's running this operation with the the Patriot Act, uh, they are saying that oh wait, oh here we go uh, uh, the NSA will now begin steps uh, to wind down the bulk telephone metadata program in anticipation of possible sunset in order to ensure that it does not engage in any unauthorized collection or use of the metadata. Now they went on to say. And also, if you want to try to actually start this back up again, it's going to take some time. 
So basically, they're trying to, to play the national security card. Say, hey, you should be afraid that your 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 actions of getting rid of this Patriot Act is going to, to result in an, an American attack, an attack on American soil. And you will be the senator that is responsible for Americans dying. You know, this is the, the kind of thing that they're trying to pressure. You know, honestly, my whole philosophy when it comes to this is that, you know, freedom is not free. Number one, it costs. And one of those costs is security. I mean, you, you, you have to start taking responsibility for your own security. You have to take personal responsibility for your own actions. And you have to understand that there will be levels of insecurity in a, in a free society. There will be dangers. There will be things that may go wrong. However, it's better than the alternative. It is absolutely better than the alternative. And I won't get into all that right now. But it's, as far as... Um, as far as this is concerned, uh, like I said, I I tend to believe that right now this is uh, this is Rand Paul's attempts of basically giving showmanship. I, I and you know it, maybe it's his way of, of driving a wedge between him and Mitch because this was a big deal to me and and this is also another point that I have to, I have to illustrate here. Uh, he endorsed Mitch McConnell. He is one of the Rand Paul is responsible for helping get Mitch McConnell reelected. And for me, this is this is one of those issues because I, I I've said, you know, uh, this is a big deal to me because if you if you endorse somebody, you're saying that you endorse their policies, their agendas, things along those lines. And uh obviously Mitch stands way at the other political end of the spectrum as far as, you know, right to privacy, things along those lines that Rand Paul says he, he supports and this is what he, he's a, a proponent of. But to support somebody that is the exact opposite of these policies is astounding. And I don't I don't know what he was thinking, why he did it, but it really put me off. It put a bad taste in my mouth with Rand. I do not trust him now. I really feel like he, he, he you know, he's doing some backdoor deals that I don't trust now. And now I'm looking at this, you know, very, very distrustful. I mean, that's, that's really the only word to use for it. Let me read the article here. I'll let you guys know what actually happened here. After declining to pass the USA Freedom Act, the Senate blocked an outright extension of the Patriot Act early Sunday morning. As a result, the, con- uh, the controversial Section 215 has, been, has not been renewed, and the NSA must begin winding down its collection of Americans' bulk data in preparation for the section's expiration if no renewal is passed by the end of the month. They have until the end of the month. To my knowledge, this hasn't been passed yet. Perhaps it has. Maybe it'll be passed when... Uh, it's over. Anyway, this is written by Rachel Blevins on truthandmedia.com. And uh, by the way, if you're not familiar, with, and maybe I should discuss this, uh, let's let's first start out with uh, the, the bulk metadata. What is metadata? Uh, well, it's like every bit of information about who you called, if you had a GPS location, uh, where your call was, maybe your text messages, the duration of the call, you know, uh, Things along those lines. That's, that's metadata. And the, the government can just go in to these companies who have these data. And they basically just take all this. They get a warrant for one company. Boom. Verizon. Hello. Getting all of your your information on all of your customers. Boom. And that's not the way that the, uh, the first, I'm sorry, the Fourth Amendment works. You know, you have to have uh, exactly where you're going to be searched What's going to be seized? Who you're who you're looking for? Things along those lines, and, and that's basically a general warrant. You know, say, all right, I give you permission to, uh, you know, search anybody's house in Texas. You know what I mean? That's a general warrant. It's just basically you can generally search anybody. We don't do general warrants, and that was one of the big reasons that we fought the American Revolution. Is people were sick of being treated like that, where the government can just come in and bust into your house. Oh, we got a general warrant to look anywhere we want in this town, so we're going to look. All right, okay, all right, you're good to go. Or, oh, oh, you got something here that you're not supposed to have, and, you know, whatever happened with that. So this is, this is really upsetting when we start talking about the use of general warrants. The NSA has overstepped, and this is a, extremely unconstitutional in my personal opinion, a complete violation of the Fourth Amendment. However, let me just also point out, anyone trying to tell you that they're not listening to your phone calls, they're, they're doing a little tongue-in-cheek. Because let's just point out one simple fact. Edward Snowden, 
he released documents proving that though the data is not actually being listened to, your phone calls are not being listened to live, it is being data mined and collected in centers in Utah and stored, and they can store every single human communication for like the next 50 years, something along those lines. Uh, I think it's actually 20 years, what, and that's what we know right now. Every single human electronic communication. So everything, your emails, your, your phone calls, they can, they can record your phone calls, Skype. It's a, they, there's already leaks out now that, that they've recorded every single Skype call that's ever been made. Every single one, and it's in a data mining center. Now they may not, they may not have listened to them, and this is the tongue in cheek that that you're hearing when people say they're not listening to your phone calls, but they're storing it and they have it accessible if they want it. And if they, you know, it doesn't take anything for a government agent just to go type into a database and somebody who has access to that kind of stuff to go look. And if they want to make an example out of somebody, they can pull and rip through every single digital communication that they've ever had in their entire life that they have on record. Boom, right there. And who knows what could be in there? So maybe something embarrassing. Maybe something that they could be blackmailed against. Who knows the, the, the abuses that could potentially take place in this? And it is important to note that this information came from Edward Snowden's leaks. And it is more important to point out that Edward Snowden has not been disproven. No one has been able to disprove Edward Snowden's claims and his data. So why is this happening? Why isn't this something that the American people are up in arms about? Everybody knows this is going on. This is such common knowledge. Everybody is aware of this, but nobody's, nobody's up in arms. Nobody's doing anything about it. And again... Uh, you know, I, I don't think that we need to we need to have a American revolution. I think we need to educate, explain it to people why this is important. You know, if if you want to talk to people, you want to go talk to your friends, your family, let them know this is important stuff to pay attention to. So, uh, you know, bulk spying, you know, th- that is the antithesis of what our founders wanted for this country and they would be rolling over in their graves if they knew what was happening uh it, i mean this kind of police state this kind of federal leviathan the surveillance state that is being built you don't build these things without the intention of using them and even if we believe that those in power right now are angels even if we believe that there's no way that obama would ever turn the key and turn on the machine of tyranny what about the next guy and the guy after that, governments don't willingly give up their power unless they are being pressured by the people. Because again, all governments get their power from the consent of the people. Whether or not it's consent given under coercion or voluntarily. It's important to know that every time you pay taxes, you are consenting to your government's actions. And uh, I'm not advocating you don't pay taxes. But what I am saying is that we need to make a change. And it has to be an intellectual one. It can't be at the point of a gun because it's going to end badly. We're going to be worse off. Liberty will be gone in this country. The, The only thing we have holding back the forces right now is the fact that we have a strong constitution and the courts have yet to completely trample every single right that we have you know i i think that we in my opinion and i've been a big proponent of uh, of the amendment process to restore the constitution uh, i don't believe that the constitution is a living breathing document however i believe things have gone off the rails in our government and it's time that we do things to bring us back to a more republic form of government a more constitutional government and stop these freaking restrictions uh, on our liberties you know one of our biggest problems that we have now is that we have no damn clue what goes on in congress because they bury shit Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I usually don't curse on the air. <laughs> they bury stuff. I got I got carried away there. But they bury this stuff so much, it, like underneath all these different uh, legislative. So they put like pork is what they call it. They, they just bury all this crap o- over top of things that they're trying to do. So, for example, let's say you have a, a, a bill as a senator and you're trying to pass lunches for kids who can't afford lunches. All right. It's the lunches for kids who can't afford lunches bill. All right. And 
And you also squeeze in a bunch of other crap in there about like, let's see here. Uh, okay, let's say I, you know, I'm a, I'm a senator, and I had a campaign donation from a big oil company, and. I want to give them a tax break, so I, I include into this a tax break. And then in order to get that passed through Congress, uh, through the Senate, maybe I have to include other people's pork barrels into it to get enough votes. Okay, so now we got you know this, this tax break for GE and now a tax break for Apple, a tax break for all these other – this is crony corporatism. This is what we're talking about. This is not capitalism. This is crony corporatism. So – this is they, they pile all these things into one bill, and then if you're the senator that's, that votes no against that bill, they use it against you. Oh, you know, let's say I was a senator, for example. Let's say Mac. Mac is that senator who voted against the, the providing lunches for kids who can't afford lunches bill, whatever it was called. <laughs> but and really, no, I'm saying no. I don't want to. I don't want to be involved in this kind of corporatism, this crony corporatism, where I'm giving all these this money and, and tax breaks for all these billionaires and companies and things along those lines, uh, and I'm making it harder on the little guys in those sectors too. Basically, essentially creating monopolies. And again, governments create monopolies. So, what I think is a major issue is all of this tacking on pork barrel legislation. So, what we need to do. Is in my personal opinion, pass a pass a bill that makes it so, or pass an amendment to our constitution that makes it so Congress can only have a one item legislation, one item bill. You can't add more than one thing to it. You know, it can only have one topic. So if you want to have a thing for kids who can't afford school lunches, that's all it can be. You can't put in any bailouts. You want to have a bailout thing? If you want to have some kind of tax breaks for your your cronies. You know, people who gave you campaign donations, try to pass that bill by itself. Let's see if that flies. And in my personal opinion, I don't think that Congress should work more than three months out of the year. That's just me. You know, let me ask you guys. When the government shut down, back, even back, you remember back when Ted Cruz was involved in that whole thing and he was, you know, he was saying that Harry Reid shut down the government and all this stuff because they didn't want to fund it piecemeal. Uh, you know, Harry Reid's government shut down, by the way. We'll just remind people that Harry Reid shut down the government. But let me ask you, when the government shut down, did you suffer? Did your life get worse? Did you even notice any any difference? And for me personally, I didn't notice it. In fact, I was happy that the government shut down because at least I know they're not out there screwing things up. Uh, at least I know that we are not out, out here getting actively screwed over more. So, the people that that were basically laid off or, or temporarily not working were they were allowed to get unemployment. FYI, uh, they may have had to repay that back afterwards. But if if they got uh, compensated back pay, because by the way they did get back paid. So this is what happens: they they lose their job, or at least in that little time period when the government shut down, they they're not working. They go on unemployment, and then they get back paid, and they got to pay back their unemployment. Some some people, there's one place in Oregon where they were talking about how they didn't want to pay back the money to unemployment. So you're supposed to be getting paid twice for doing no work. I don't think these people should be getting paid at all for doing no work. And let's just ask this question. Who was affected by the government shutdown? Who gets affected by this? Non-essential personnel. And... Those non-essential personnel work for the government. So, if most Americans, I am one of those people that did not notice the difference when the government was shut down. I'm sure you're probably like them. Most Americans didn't notice a difference. The only ones that we really hear complaining and on the news and making a big stick about it are the people who were laid off during this time period that work for the government. Can I just point out a simple fact that your existence does not justify your job. You don't have a right to a job, all right, especially in the public sector. Just because you needed that money, you needed that income, that doesn't mean that your job is necessary. If you were already one of those unnecessary jobs that nobody felt any pain for you not working during that time period... I personally think that you shouldn't have a job in the first place. And if, if I'm making people upset at me that work for the government, I'm sorry. I, that's, I'm just telling it like it is. You are not the justification for your job. Your job has to have a need for it to be there if you are on the government teat, if you're getting paid for by the taxpayers. 
That's just my opinion. Anyway, so let's go ahead and move on here. I want to I want to talk about a couple other articles we got. We got a couple of minutes, uh, 15 minutes left in the show here. Let's talk about a few other articles here. And in fact, let's go into our weekly defender. I want to get to one article uh, that I, in particular, that I thought was crazy. So uh, here we go, weekly defender. And now it's time for Weekly Defender. You have the right to defend your life, the right to defend your family, and the right to defend your freedom. All right, this is a segment of the show where we talk about armed citizens in the news who have used their firearms to protect their family, their property, something along those lines, maybe in themselves. Something something along those lines, basically. So uh, we got another article here from Infowars.com. Uh, and there's a video on this article that I will not play because it is explicit. Uh, and by the way, I do apologize for cursing. I usually usually have that uh, handled. I usually don't curse on this show. Uh, usually the most you get from me is, gee golly. So <laughs> the, uh, the the video does, does have some... Uh, some uh, offensive language, which I'm not going to play for you guys, but uh, basically this is uh, a guy who was attempting to carjack an armed citizen. So, uh, and this armed citizen is holding this uh, this man at gunpoint until police arrive. So, uh, this is it, it is insane. So the guy's basically laying on the ground, and uh, you know he's cur- the the guy with the gun is sitting there cursing at this guy like uh, you're a dumb you know person. For coming, you know, coming into my car. Basically, the, he was sitting at uh, in his car, and this guy just hopped in, and he picked the wrong car to rob that day because that guy had him out on the ground. And this guy is extremely compliant in the video. You should definitely check it out. Uh, and I'll read the article here. Uh, by the way, again, Infowars.com, uh, written by Adon Sal- Salazar uh, on the 22nd of uh, this year. So, uh, 22nd of this month, this year. So, uh, I let's see. Hashim Fanin, a resident of Atlanta of an Atlanta suburb, walked out of a Family Dollar store yesterday to find an unfamiliar person inside his vehicle. Oh, okay, so maybe I got it wrong. Uh, I asked him to get out of the car. Probably not in those exact words, Fanin told WSB TV News. Fanin proceeded to draw his pistol and ordered the would-be carjacker, 61-year-old Edgar Horn, onto the pavement. I told him, no, there's no leaving Leaving was before you hopped in my car. At this point, there is not leaving, Fanin said. Just stay there and wait for the police. The armed man can be heard telling Horn in the video. Thought you were just going to take my stuff, Fanin tells the man laying face down on the ground. You picked the wrong dude to rob today. Uh, Fanin uh, is seen uh, placing his gun on a nearby curb just as officers arrive on the scene, indicating to them he is not a threat. Uh, but one of the officers walks over to Fanin and shakes his hand, thanking him for protecting his community. Honestly, I look at this that uh, I look at it like this: uh, that is one less guy I got to worry about bothering my mom when she's out grocery shopping. Fanin said, "In Georgia, both concealed and open carry of a handgun is permitted with a valid Georgia uh, weapons carry license." And uh, I just want to point out to all these race baiters out there who are saying, "Oh, police departments are so racist! Oh my God! Oh, race, race, race!" All right, the uh, the individual who was armed, the armed citizens in this situation was an African American male and he was not shot on sight by police. Uh, this is, this is one of those circumstances that is going to be ignored by, you know, Al Sharpton and, you know, Jesse Jackson. This is good on these police for not, for not automatically assuming that this guy is a perpetrator. Good on him. Uh, you know, and the police actually shook his hand. There's a picture of it in the video shaking his hand. The police officer shaking the armed citizen's hand for a job well done. And this just goes to show you, not all of our police are racist. I don't think it's even as big of an issue as as it's being made out to be. It may be an issue. It. I'm not saying it's not an issue. Racism exists. It is a real thing. However... I think it is is dumb politics, you know, where people are just shouting down their opposition, and the best way to do that is to call them a racist because now you put them on their heels. Oh, you're a racist. Now I can't even engage with you whatever we're debating on. I got to sit here and say, oh, well, you know, I'm not a racist. Look, let me defend myself. I got to talk about me now instead of the issues, and and that that is that is what they do. But really, 
it's ineffective because to me what I what I see when somebody calls me a racist, I I laugh at them because I'm not. I'm one of the least racist people I know. I you know, I, I just I don't I don't really care much about, you know, that kind of stuff. It just doesn't bother me. It does I don't I don't really think about it that often. But uh you know, I, not only do I laugh at them, but uh, I I, I see I see it as their desperation to win the argument. You know, you're not going to shout me down. You're not going to make me afraid to 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 be your opposition because you're going to call me a racist. Whatever, call me a racist. Big deal. <laughs> I've I've been called worse, honestly. So anyway, we're going to cut to a quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to uh, maybe cover a couple more article articles. I got one more uh, awesome one that I want to get to. Uh, and uh, anyway, we'll be right back. Uh, and if you guys want to join the conversation, by the way, please feel free to give us a call. The number of the show is 360-450-5625, 360-450-5625. Or you can email the show at talk at onthemoveshow.com. Anyway, we'll be right back after this break. Don't go anywhere. Oath Keepers is a nonpartisan association of current active duty military, reserve, guard, veterans, peace officers, and firefighters who will fulfill the oath we swore with the support of like-minded citizens who take an oath to stand with us to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So help us God. Join us at OathKeepers.org. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services, from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. Casting from deep within occupied territory on the far left coast. You're listening to On the Move with Mac Worley the Third. Stand up, speak out, and get on the move. But now your host, Mac Worley the Third. And we're back. All right, so before we get into uh, one of our articles, I want to bring up a conversation that we were talking about. Um, actually, you know what? We're probably not going to have time for it. I wanted to get to Indian prisoner rights conversation today, but I don't think that we're going to have time for it. i got to try, but we only got seven minutes left in the program. And I want to talk about uh, this article here on St. Louis Today, or St. – yeah, it's uh, stltoday.com, uh, written by Jennifer Mann, M-A-N-N, um, and this article is talking about, by the way, this linked from one of our listeners, so thank you so much for the link. And uh, municipalities ticket for trees and toys as traffic revenue declines. This is in Pagedale, St. Louis. Um, let's see here. Yeah, this must be a suburb or something outside of St. Louis. Uh, drive through this working class suburb, uh, I was right, filled with 1950s cottages, and you will see many edged and weeded lawns. You'll notice orange sticky notes on the doors at least one or two per street in many parts of the town they are warnings the city gives to residents who violate local ordinances and in this community of 3304 residents the list of what earns a ticket is a f- is uh, a ticket and a fine is long among those things that will be closely monitored through the spring and summer according to a newsletter that recently went out to residents Pants worn too low or grass grown too high. Pants worn too low. So I don't know if they're referring to like maybe uh, people busting a sag, 
you know, wearing their pants way low or something like that, or uh, the ever dreaded plumber's crack where people are out there doing yard work and you can see their crack. Uh, but grass too high, children riding bikes without helmets, oh geez, call the nanny state, uh, barbecue pits or toys in the front yards, basketball hoops in the streets, there's no loitering described in city code as the concept of spending time idly or the colloquial expression hanging around. And despite the citywide 20 mile per hour speed limit, there's no playing or walking in the street. Faye Millett, one of the aldermen who wrote the newsletter, said the ordinance are aimed at safety and quality of life. Pagedale is in the midst of a massive redevelopment effort aimed at drawing businesses to its main corridors and restoring a population that has fallen off since the 1960s. Well, let me just give you my, my take on this first of all. There's a ton more to this story, so feel free to look it up. Uh, but... This is crazy. This is the kind of craziest nonsense I've ever heard of. Uh, first of all, the people that are there, later in this article, they start talking about the kind of money that people have had to spend on the violations. And first of all, you get a violation, you have to go to court to, to defend it, to defend yourself. You actually have to show up. And it you know this takes time off of work. It costs money to do all that. But in addition, each time that they, that they have to... They have like some one of these little tickets that they put. Most of it's for like damage on your property, things you have to fix, uh, outrageous stuff. Uh, there was a, one couple that was given a, a deadline uh, to do several things, uh, such as add screens and curtains to their windows. Who the heck is the government to tell you what you have to do with your own home? First of all, screens and curtains to my windows? Get real. They wanted them to remove uh, a dead branch from a, a tree out back, replace a missing shingle. One missing shingle. Use weed killer, finish repairing the garage, install a rear screen door. The repair these kind of repairs cost money, and th this couple that we're, I'm talking about right now, they had their tab had grown to be one thousand eight hundred dollars or eight hundred ten dollars, and they're paying it a hundred dollars a month uh, at a time. They still got eight hundred dollars to pay off. Uh, unbelievable! The kind of, they're just getting taxed like crazy. But think about this, okay? They're trying to draw people to this town. They're trying to reinvigorate this town, and the population has been drawing off since the 1960s. Well, obviously, who the hell would want to live in a town like this, where these totalitarians are coming in and telling you every single thing that you can and can't do, and they give you one day's notice to fix something, otherwise you have to appear in court, because now it's a violation, it costs you money, you got to pay a fine, for your own property. This is your property, you own it. And the government can, it does not have the right to come in and tell you what to do. And it's not even like you joined, signed some kind of contract with the HOA. They're ch over here changing city code. They're just, the, the laws are just changing around you. You may have lived there and everything been fine for decades. And now suddenly they're over there changing things on you. I think this is messed up. This is so messed up. Property rights is so important and it's not being respected in this city, in Pagedale. Uh, I highly recommend you guys check out this article. It's it's outrageous. Anyway, we posted it on uh, our uh, our Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash on the move show. Please go there right now, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash on the move show and join our group. I want you guys in the group. I want everybody to get involved and have conversations. Anyway, we're about ready to head out. I just want to say thanks to all of you guys for tuning in. Thanks so much, uh, Mac Pack, for tuning in week after week. You guys are the reason why we do this. And uh, anyway, uh, we're going to go ahead and take off. Don't forget to check us out on our website, onthemoveshow.com. Follow us at spreaker.com forward slash onthemoveshow. Like us on facebook.com forward slash onthemoveshow. Subscribe to us on youtube.com forward slash onthemoveshow. And follow us at twitter.com forward slash on the move show and as always know your rights assert your rights and get on the move